you know, your, your greatest team partner is someone you can trust um, that is not there for themselves, but is there to play ping pong with you to, you can't play ping pong if the other person isn't as good as you, you know, in that sense of, I want you to do well. It's a, it's a much more fun game if you get to keep playing ping pong, you know, who wants to just slam the, the ball off. You want to play and you want to be, you know, feel that you have trust and that you're supported and loved. And that's one thing about Linda is that we, we trusted each other so much and had each other's backs. Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Perry Nemiroff with Collider. Now, without further ado, I have the honor of introducing our nominees for Outstanding Female Actor in a Comedy Series at the SAG Awards. First up, we have Christina Applegate, of course, for Dead to Me. Rachel Brosnahan for The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Quinta Brunson for Abbott Elementary. Jenna Ortega for Wednesday. And Jean Smart for Hacks. Yeah. <laughs> Yet another congratulations. I feel very, very spoiled to get to talk about all of your shows, which I love dearly. I also love award season and I can be a very big cheese ball about what award season can mean to everybody. So Christina, Jean and Rachel, I'm going to throw this first question to you because you're our returning SAG nominees here. And the meaning of this kind of recognition can change over the years for a variety of really for a variety of reasons, you know, where you're at in your life, where you're at in your career, how the industry has evolved. So for each of you, what would you say is the biggest difference between what your first SAG nomination meant to you and what this one? that we're celebrating today means? Um, should we go alphabetical? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I've been a member of SAG since 1975. So um, it always is a huge honor um, to be recognized by this beautiful union that has taken care of me and my family um, and all of us for this long. But this is kind of my swan song. So it's kind of, it's, it is this year a really big deal for me because I don't know if I'm going to work anymore. So I'm just so incredibly grateful to uh, sit down with uh, all my people. How about for you, Jean? Oh, I thought we were going alphabetical. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's true. And it, it, it sounds, you know, like lip service, but I mean, it, it, it's true. I think in any, any job, I think the, the, um, the admiration or the respect that you get from coworkers is, probably the most important it's as much as you want your fans to love your show and or your customers to love your product it doesn't matter what it is but I think the people that you work with if they if you feel like they respect what you do and that's that's the most you can ask for it's wonderful I went first name alphabetical and that leads us to you Rachel oh first name sorry <laughs> yeah at, at the risk of sounding totally cornwall I mean it it I feel like my peers are the only people whose opinions I care about the most, you know? And so it, it, um, they're the people I'm the most nervous to, to have eyeballs on, on anything that I've done. And so I feel like the first time it was, it was absolutely shocking and such an incredible honor. And, and yeah, I mean, now maybe, maybe even more so, you know, we've been, we've been on the air for, four seasons now and to to be invited back to the party is um is enormously meaningful and I feel like my heart just grew five sizes the day that the, uh nominations came out and I mean look at this company it's insane <laughs> I was thinking that when they invited me to moderate this and I'm looking at this list I'm like is this real life someone please pinch me uh Jen and Quinta I'm coming your way now because this is a first time nomination from SAG for for both of you and you know from an outsider's perspective of course but it it feels like this type of nomination is one of those dreamlike scenarios that you don't fully wrap your head around until it actually happens and your name is announced so what would you say was the most surprising part of your reaction when you heard your name announced when the nominations were revealed? If we're still going alphabetical. I like um, it. Yeah, I I truly, I, I don't anticipate or expect anything. So I think that to um, 
I don't know. I, I think it, I, I had never really fathomed something like this happening, let alone uh, alongside so many people that I respect and admire so much and have for such a long time. I think that um, I, I I feel really, really grateful. I, I'll never forget how important it was to me receiving my first SAG card. And as soon as I did enough commercials to make it in the union, I, I am very, very passionate about the job and work that I do. And I, I, I don't know. I just, um, I feel like I still kind of don't believe it now. I just feel incredibly privileged and um, really, really excited. All right, Quinta, you're bringing us home now. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, it's a huge honor. One, because it, it just is. It's, you know, it's an honor to be nominated um, amongst these women. It's a dream come true. And then two, I um, find myself split between the writing world and um, you know, well, and then also produ producing in that world. And then acting is the one area where, um, you know, I'm, I'm like, I, I'm proud of what I do and I'm proud to be able to do a good job. It's the one area where I'm like, I feel that the women I'm around right now are, are so much better than me at it. I don't know how to explain it. It's one of those weird things where I'm like, this is something that you, everyone has put their all into it. And I just feel humbled to be nominated in the same category. And like, you know, like you guys were saying about your peers, like these are my peers. It, it feels um, a little surreal to be considered, you know, nomination material. Well-deserved across the board. We'll get to this soon, but I love the fact that you're all representing shows that yes, are comedy series, but all feel very, very, very different within the comedy sphere and, and very uniquely each of you where I look at your roles and only you five can bring those roles to screen the way that you did. And that's that's part of the reason why we're celebrating you right now. Quinn, I'm going to stick with you for a minute because you did just bring up the writing. You're also the creator and wear many hats on this production. And I wanted to touch on that through something that I think many people out there, no matter what your role on a set is, can maybe relate to and maybe have struggled with. It's this idea of kind of trusting your own gut versus adhering to. I guess for for lack of better terms, what the higher ups might want, because I was reading another interview you did where, you know, you found the perfect home at ABC. But I've heard you mention that another network didn't really understand the value of Abbott Elementary. So I was wondering if you could kind of walk us through what it's like figuring out when to listen to those types of executives who essentially can give a green light versus trusting your own gut and where you think the show needs to go. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a big question. That's a big question. I'll narrow it down to acting. I mean, I feel like we make choices as actresses. We believe we know there's something special about this character. It's a reason that we took a role or auditioned for a role, because there's something in that voice that there's something in that character where we can we can see the vision of what that needs to be, what how the character needs to smile or not smile or cry or not cry. And um, I just think it's important for all artists to trust their instincts and their voice and work with the people, you know, that they're around, their directors, their fellow actors, their, um, for me, in, in our case, the, the network, you know, I have to, I have to hear what they're saying, but also make sure that I'm bringing what is special, unique, and honest about Abbott and thus my character, Janine, to life. And I think, um, it's just remembering that as actresses, we're just as important a part of the creative process as any other part of the creative process. Like your voice and your take on a character is important and helps paint the full picture. To build on that a little and maybe give our viewers kind of a, a tool that they could put in their own back pocket and maybe use if they find themselves in this type of situation. Is there any particular element of Janine that maybe, you know, someone said, nah, Janine doesn't need this, but it felt important to you and you wanted to kind of step up and fight for that and make sure it was incorporated in the character? Oh, yeah. I mean, just uh, <laughs> for her to be flawed, for her to have... Um, bad relationships, not only with um, her, <clears throat> with, with, with men, but also with her mother um, and to have qualities that aren't technically likable. There's still the push to make women likable, even in the unlikable <laughs> woman category. So I pushed really hard for her to have qualities that weren't necessary. I don't really care about likability. My goal is to try to get a well-formed character onto the screen. And I still feel like 
we're fighting the likable woman narrative a little bit. <laughs> Great success in that respect. And for what it's worth, I identify with a couple of her qualities that make yes. me make me feel seen and better about certain things I do. I feel like I'm going in reverse alphabetical. No, I'm not. I have just messed up the alphabet. I'm going to go to you, Rachel. We're, we're going to go around the other way. So one thing I wanted to bring up for you was that I've heard time and time again what a wonderful leader you are on that set and just what a positive influence you are for everybody. So looking back, what would you say surprised you most about what it takes to headline a series, not just as the lead actor playing the title character, but also as someone who can influence the whole vibe in the entire company. I suppose it was just that idea. You know, I, I had spent a long time as someone who, I guess, who's never felt that comfortable taking up a lot of space. Um, and especially on on other sets, I think I, I was very nervous stepping into that role and seeing in real time how you have the ability to impact the the vibe on a set. But truthfully, I've been so lucky. And as we've been, as we, you know, we recently finished shooting our last season, I've been so lucky. I've been reflecting on how lucky I've been to have been in this industry for 10 years or so, and to have had so many mentors who took the time and really graciously took the time to, to either lead by example or talk to me about what it meant to step into that position. Um, and on this set alone, I mean, Tony Shalhoub and Alex Borstein and Marin Hinkle, you know, it's filled with people who have been around for a really long time. And so I, uh, I feel an enormous responsibility to pay forward the kind of generosity that has been given to me over the years in big and small ways. You know, I feel like I tell these stories all the time, especially as it relates to SAG, but I am, um, you know, I, I will never forget stepping onto a set early, early, straight out of college, doing a, a film where I played a very small role in a film that Emma Thompson was in and Emma Thompson running out of this trailer and going, we're so happy you're here. And it changed my life, you know? And so I, um, it feels very easy to do, I suppose, to, to be able to have the privilege to, to pay that forward in real time. And yeah, it's a, also surrounded by people who are like-minded that way. Well, for what it's worth from everything that I hear, you're definitely doing that right now. And I'm sure you're going to continue to do so in the future. Jean, I'm going to come to you to focus a little more specifically on, on your character. Going into the making of Hacks, what what quality of Deborah's were you most looking forward to playing? But now two seasons in, what part of her or corner of her world proved to be more creatively fulfilling than you ever could have imagined on day one? Well, I just... The, the joy I get from doing the, 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 the scenes where I'm actually doing stand-up because it's totally no, no, a safe artificial situation where there's extras there who are being paid to laugh at me. But it, it, so I don't have any of that uh, risk that real stand-ups do, who I boy is my hat off to them. Um, but it is just so much fun. And I don't know, I don't know what, what that is, but it, it's, um, and as COVID has sort of eased up and everything, with, because at first I was just doing my stand-up routines to a couple of crew members. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, oh, no. wasn't quite the same, <laughs> but they, they would they would try their best to laugh. But um, but now that you know we get and and so and, and I just have fun. And between takes, I just keep trying to make them laugh just so that everybody's having a fun and it just feels like a party and it, and it actually feels like a nightclub. And, and, and that is just so much fun. But, you know, there's the majority of the show is really not about that. As, as they told me when I first started the show, they said, it's not really about her being a stand-up. It's about, you know, the kind of person she is. And, 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 and in terms of likability, she's obviously not always that likable, but um, she, she, she respects people who work hard um, she's not a diva in that sense. She doesn't treat underlings poorly simply because they're not on the same professional level as her. I, I, I always say that, but unless she's in a bad mood, and then <laughs> you know, it's just um, right now we're in, we're in the middle of season three, and we're getting to her relationship with her sister, which is probably the catalyst for her entire adult life. What what 
how she is and how her, her fears and paranoia is and her, her, her anger, her source of her anger. And, and um, so her sister now is coming back into her life. And, but we have to, you know, we have to kind of figure out because, you know, they, she was my little sister and then she almost became sort of, I was more maternal towards her because our parents died and, you know, my dad was a drunk and they got, my parents died and then I had her and then, and then she runs off with my husband. So it's sort of like she lost her whole, she lost everything in literally a moment. She lost the love of her life and her, the only family she had. And so Very that, eager to explore that sort of made her the kind of person she is. I'm eager to explore that great, great success in exploring her as an individual. But one of the greatest joys of the show is seeing the surprising ways she influences everyone around her, which is is such a beautiful thing. I can't get the, well, the, the end of season two in particular, that that conversation and setting Ava on her way will will never I'll never forget that particular interaction. It really is a beautiful, very well earned moment. Yeah, our writers are incredible. All right, Christina, you're up now. So after two seasons of Dead to Me, you think I would be very well prepared for wild, shocking twists and turns and and like out of left field behavior and all that wild stuff. But season three is kind of still filled with things that caught me off guard. So I'm wondering from your perspective, is there anything that Jen went through or a decision she made in season three that when you first got those scripts surprised even you and you had to kind of sit with it and think through it more? Um. Yeah, I, I think, you know, season three is, is it's all the things that um, you don't want to know <laughs> that we didn't want to have to experience um, on professionally, personally, all the things. But it was it was like it, it, it's like um, before we did the second season and Liz said to me, um, Marzen's coming back as a twin. And I said to her, I, are you punking me? <laughs> like, no, we don't. That doesn't make any sense. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And she goes, can you just trust me? So when we got to season three, it was, it was like my hands were in hers and, and you had to trust that the craziest scenarios that she was coming up with were going to work because that's life. You know, life is unpredictable. Life doesn't make any sense sometimes. And, you know, how we ended it is what nobody wanted to watch. Um, but everyone wanted to watch and we, we got to kind of live that. And um, so it, it was a very um, cathartic, you know, I mean, my own personal issues, but it was such a cathartic year of um, saying goodbye. You know, life is about these ups and downs and hellos and goodbyes and people coming in. And, you know, when they say seasons, reasons and lifetimes and, and for Jen and Judy, they were lifetimes. And, and even though one of them is not on the planet anymore, that's, that's your lifetime. You, you feel those people in your heart. So I loved um, every moment of it. It was so outlandish and, and, but it was so real and, and we felt it every day. And uh, Judy, Judy changed Jen forever. So she lives on through her. And I think forever. it's a beautiful, very well-earned thing in that show. When you go, yeah. When you go back to season one and, and, you know, Jen was, was a Cobra, you know, like, you know, it, it just attacked everything because that's how she didn't have to feel and she didn't have to hurt was to beat the shit out of people, basically, um, you know, with her her words, her emotions, herself. And by three, you know, she's has love in her life again. And, you know, it's it's such a beautiful 180. All right, Jenna. You are up now for for Wednesday. I feel like with a character like that, if you don't get, I don't know, everything from like the tone to the look to the way she's carrying herself, everything like pitch perfect, that character just plain old doesn't work and you make it work. So it was making me wonder what was the biggest difference between the way you envisioned that character and what you needed to do to play her day one when you first got the role and then who she turned out to be as you got the chance to explore and understand her more. Ooh, um, well, let me think. It's it's kind of strange because uh, while Wednesday is very, very deadpan, I feel like there's several different routes that you could have taken her. And I think that 
those are all routes that we uh, tried some sort of version of during camera tests and things like that with Tim. And ultimately, at uh, you, you realize that Wednesday as a, as a teenage girl, um, her natural nasty nature, it doesn't always translate in the kindest way or the most likable way. Uh, so I think that if you're going to spend so much time with someone, uh, she's practically in every scene for eight hours, uh, you do have to find some sort of, um, it, there has to be something somewhat enticing about her to keep you going on, but but nothing that gets too annoying or on your nerves, especially because I feel like the leads of shows are never the favorite character, which I, I didn't want to do that to Wednesday Adams. So I think that... Um, finding the the right way to go with Wednesday I I decided because she makes a lot of really poor decisions in the show or isn't always ahead of the ball is wrongly accusing people I noticed that there had to be I really had to lean into how youthful she was and the fact that she was a young teenager because um it makes a lot of her actions more excusable and I felt like um it also it, it felt more natural to her I felt like she had to be very naive if she was doing something that was toxic or manipulative or making the wrong decision, it was because she didn't have much real social interaction in her life. And um, she didn't know how to navigate that. And there's a natural anxiety that comes with that. And um, I guess just kind of unknowing. And for someone who's always been so sure of herself, I felt like that was also kind of my key into an emotional arc throughout the season, even though she's not uh, an emotion full character. Um, but I realized that if if she was so self-assured to actually have people come in and prove her wrong and her realize that she was wrong is a huge, huge jump for the character. And um, that's that's kind of the only way I could make uh, certain aspects of the show believable or at least feel natural to me in a very unnatural, surreal atmosphere. As you were describing that, I was thinking that that description almost applies to every single one of your characters, lead, lead characters who who are flawed, but also all have the ability to hear the people around them and and change and understand. And I feel like that's probably a big part of the reason why they've made such a big impression on everyone. Yeah. So we are here celebrating your own individual nominations right now, but I can never get enough of talking about what it means to have a good scene partner. So I'm going to pose this to the entire group. We can go alphabetically. We can go in whatever order you want. Can you each give me an example of a time on set when a co-star was just the scene partner that you needed and it helped you access something in your own character that you wouldn't have been able to without them? Can I say, can I go first? because I think it's no secret that I'm in love with Linda Cardellini. But <laughs> if any of you women ever get the chance to stand in front of that person and work with her, you will be the luckiest person on the planet. And Aww. that, that's, I mean, well, except Jean, I love you. And we did, you, it's my mom, you guys. I love you very much. Everyone knows you're amazing. But I just have to say, that girl, life, Game changer, life changer. You're going to be blessed. That's all. That's all I'm going to say about my girl. <laughs> well, I would like to say, and, and this is also, you know, includes you because I adore <laughs> playing your mommy. You know that. She still, know. Calls, she still calls me mommy. When we and you me. both adopt me. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <not> an adoption. <laughs> but, um, I, we got so lucky getting Hannah Einbinder to play opposite me because the thing that I think that is so fun, I think fun for the audience to watch is a lot of it is the, is the generational differences between them because they just are constantly <laughs> missing each other. Um, and uh, she just was, when I met her, I just said this, she's the one, I mean, I had seen some of her stand up online. But I said, she's got, she's got to be the one. I mean, she's just there. And because she hasn't done a lot of acting, she's not sort of pulling any tricks out of her bag. She's just there. And so every reaction is spontaneous and real. And that first big scene in the pilot where we meet for the first time at my home in Las Vegas, to me, it was such an important scene. It set the tone for the entire series that meeting and she was so hilarious and her, her character was sort of insecure, but also very, you know, 
just really stood up to my character, which my character wasn't used to having people stand up to her. So it was, it was, it was just so much fun to do that scene. It, we still talk about that scene. You know, it just was, it just, if that scene hadn't worked, I don't think the show would have been as successful. Yeah. I just had an experience recently um, where that this happened with one of my co-stars, Chris Perfetti, who I feel like is unsung glue of our show. Um, I know you guys feel this way too, being on shows, you know, everyone has their favorite characters and everything. And not that Jacob isn't people's favorite, but like for us, the cast, like Chris is kind of like glue. He binds us all together with his, his performances. I would say the same for Lisa Ann Walter too. Like she's able to like bind the room with her performance. She's such a good actor, but um, in the Valentine's Day episode was just, it, it just aired. But that episode was very hard for me as an actor. And I think some weeks for me on set, my brain, it, it, I, I, it can be like, all right, well, I'm focused on uh, the, the next episode or editing this episode. So my brain was not where it needed to be as an actress that week. And my friend Justin was directing and he had written that episode. And I had seen the episode through the table read, through its writing, through every part. But then when I got on set with it, I was like, this, I'm not getting this for some reason. It was the first time it ever happened to me. And Janine was supposed to be dealing with the possibility of Gregory liking her and possibly liking Gregory back. And something about it was just too infantile for me. My differences as a person were really conflicting with Janine as a character. And I was like, I know she doesn't sound um, stupid or naive or any of that. It's just, I can't get in her body right now. I was really struggling. And um, then I got to do this scene with Chris and I wished that it was the first scene that we had shot that week, <laughs> but it, it wasn't, but it was such a pivotal scene where he and I talk about um, Gregory possibly liking Janine and my director really, he was like, I kind of want Janine to get angrier. And I was like, oh, okay. And Chris, pushed me like he poked my buttons a little bit as Jacob and then it just I had this aha moment like oh my god I, I I get who she is I get what she's fighting right now she is fighting the possibility of this happening and I understood that as a writer I understood it as the creator of the show but I wasn't getting it as an actor until my scene partner and my director just made it come to life it was really it was a very surreal moment for me I'm not sure that I had really ever had that moment before. Other, the only other time was um, with Steve Buscemi on a different show where he was playing my dad. <laughs> and, but to have that experience on my own show where I'm so involved was just uh, jarring. And I'll never forget that. And I'm just forever forever grateful to, to Chris for helping me get through that and my director, Justin, for pushing me a little bit. What a good example. All right, pressure's on. Jenna, Rachel, you're the last two left on this one. Um, yeah, go for it. Uh, I, I mean, I I could sing all day long Alex Borstein's praises. She has changed my life in more ways than I can count as it relates to this show and saved my ass and pushed me and given me the real and, and lifted me up more times than I can count over five seasons of shooting with her. But one moment in particular comes to mind really early in shooting this show. I was just massively intimidated by this role, by this set, by this by this brilliant writing and, and all the brilliant comedic talent that I was surrounded by, having never done comedy at all before this show. I, when we first started shooting the stand-up, especially at the Gaslight, I just remember getting up there and just feeling so anxious and feeling like I just wanted to sink into a hole in the floor and looking to Alex during one of the first sets that Midge was supposed to be succeeding at and going, just please tell me if this is terrible. Like if, you know, Alex is a brilliant stand-up, just going, if, if you have any advice, like, please pull me aside and just help. You know? And, uh, and Alex looked at me and she went, I can't help you. Um, a stand-up never could have played this part. This is nothing like stand-up and you need to take your space. You know, this character, 
the audience, you know, is is silent in the background. Like any stand-up would get up there and feel like they were instantly bombing. So know that you have a handle on this. Take up the space that you need. Ask for what you need. You know, do do what you want to and try things. And like basically, I'll tell you if you're totally shitting the bed. But but you know, I I can't help you. And I think in that moment, she kind of empowered me into this role in a way that I will never ever forget. Um, and just taught me to listen to, to the audience that was in front of me and not try to, um, not try to become a stand up that I'm not <laughs> to try to, uh, embody this character fully. And it, um, at a really early point in the show, I think just gave me a little jolt of confidence that I really, really needed. And, uh, and there's just an immense amount of trust there all the way back to our first chemistry read together. And then a, a, a shout out to Marin Hinkle as well, who is the the mother of our entire set and one of the un, undersung heroes, I think, of our show, who just is so unbelievably funny and also has this ability to make every single person on our set feel like they're the only person in the room. And what a, what a gift that is. All right, Jenna, how about for you now? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is kind of a difficult question uh, only because I... I truly got so I, I I can't believe it how lucky I got with the cast that I ended up with in Romania. Everyone genuinely is a good, kind person. We all had such incredible uh, encounters. But then also Wednesday, she doesn't. I feel like there's not many people that I was spending necessarily more time with or sharing more scenes with. But there was uh, two characters every time I shot a scene with them. They definitely stood out to me. And that was Emma Myers, who plays my roommate, Enid and Gwendolyn Christie, who plays the headmaster at her school. They're two women that are very, very different from Wednesday. They're complete polar opposites. And I was always really excited to do a scene with them. One, not only because they're both incredible, uh, but also because I felt every decision that they made, I just kind of had to look at them and go, okay, now let's do the complete opposite of that. Like, I feel like they pushed me to... um, um, they kind of pushed me back to Wednesday's roots, especially, you know, it could get confusing when she's already in so many unnatural situations. Uh, so I feel like I also was encouraged to necessarily make more choices or experiment a bit more. Um, but I will say scenes with Gwendolyn Christie, I felt like because she's such a powerful, strong character, they both are, but Gwendolyn in particular, there were two women who were constantly going head to head, but still had so much respect and admiration for one another. And it, it's one of my favorite relationships, if not my favorite relationship in the entire series, because you kind of had to see these women battle with, ah, I want to see you succeed, but at the same time, you absolutely cannot. And I think that that was an incredible dynamic. And, and Gwen being the the trained actress that she is and having such an incredible, uh, incredible resume behind her, I felt like I was constantly learning from her. But I will say a random aha moment that got to me is an episode 107 Wednesday cries for the first and only time in the, in the entire show. And it's supposed to be a really big turning point. And I'm acting with a hand that's not really there. And every once in a while, the actor who Victor or the magician Victor, who played thing, the hand, sometimes he was there, sometimes he wasn't. And I remember they were shooting my coverage and they thought, yeah, let's bring the blue man in just so that Jenna has something to work with while we're doing this coverage right here. And I, I stood up from the table and I'm looking at him and I'm trying to compose myself. And for some random reason, he didn't do it the entire time, but Victor just started to like caress my hand. And I actually started crying. Like I, I messed up my line and I couldn't because it was so comforting at the time and so unexpected um, that that was really confusing to me, especially because I feel like I, you know, I do a lot of horror. So I feel like crying is just kind of, it happens. It's like you flip a switch, but that, actually pulled something out of me that I, I wasn't ready to expose Wednesday to yet or myself, I think. And that was a, a really, really funny moment because the, the entire crew just laughed. We couldn't believe what just happened. It was very, very obvious and meant something to me. I feel like you all just further emphasize why that's one of my favorite questions to ask. I love it. Those are all beautiful answers. A couple follow-ups. Christina, I'll come your way first, just because I could talk about the chemistry you and Linda share on Dead to Me all day long. And, you know, I'll preface this by saying you're working with scripts that are exquisitely written, but I know the two of you improv a little bit. So can you maybe pinpoint a moment in season three when you two got to play around, found some unexpected magic, and now we could see it in the show? 
Oh my goodness. Um, there are so many times because that was kind of um, what ended up kind of being our thing was in the first season when Liz realized that she, that Lynn and I could just keep talking, you know, like the script was done. You know, we always honor the words, always honor what's there, but it was sometimes the magic just happened for like 15 minutes after of just Linda and I just talking. Um, and so it, it became kind of our thing. So I'm trying to think of like a specific moment um, in season three. I mean, season three is, is um, on a personal note, a little bit of a blur to me, but um, so I'm trying to think, of, I mean, it's always there. Every scene there's, there's stuff that just came from us talking and, and then having, such trust. That was one thing I wanted to say is that, um, you know, your, your greatest scene partner is someone you can trust um, that is not there for themselves, but is there to play ping pong with you to, you can't play ping pong if the other person isn't as good as you, you know, in that sense of, I want you to do well. It's a, it's a much more fun game. If you get to keep playing ping pong, you know, who wants to just slam the, the ball off you want to play and you want to be, you know, feel that you have trust and that you're supported and loved. And that's one thing about Linda is that we, we trusted each other so much and had each other's backs. And she is by far one of the most incredible people I've stood in front of in a place where everything went away. Sorry, my phone just keeps falling. Um, there wasn't a crew anymore. There wasn't anyone. Um, so I'm trying to think of specifics. I really can't, but you can kind of tell when when it's just the two of us talking and, and um, of course, as Jen and Judy, but it's, uh, yeah, I can't think of like a specific, but I'm sure you can, you know, what is it called? Easter egg it. <laughs> right? I, I always try not to get too lost in the idea that your, your chemistry and your back and forths feel so natural to me and undervalue the value of having a really good rich, rich script, which I know you all have, but everything feels so fluid. And again, specifically you too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We, yeah, we, um, we, it was encouraged. It was always like, all right, guys, now we've got it go. And so it was always at the end of the scene or sometimes in the middle, you know, the back and forths, if the two of us are standing next to each other, facing someone, that's usually just us riffing, um, or in whatever you call it in the industry, in the act, in the acting place. <laughs> um, those are usually just us going off. And then finally they'll be like, all right, enough, stop talking both of you go back to the script <laughs> too too good you both are so incredible at that i'll come back your way now jenna so I know it was very important for you on this show to do as much as you could yourself, like learning to play the cello, fencing and, and stuff beyond that as well. So I have a, a two parter on that one. Can you name something that maybe someone else recommended you not do yourself, but it was important to you to do it and, and you stuck with it and explain why that was important to you? Ooh, um, that's a bit difficult. I mean, I feel like I feel like fencing sometimes they they said that only because they didn't want to do traditional fencing. They wanted to do movie fencing. So people were doing flips and things like that with no hands. And I decided to let, you know, the stunt double do that because I still had to work the next day. Um, or I, I feel like for the most part, I put the most pressure on myself regarding the cello. And uh, they wanted to do a lot of hand insert shots. And um, I think because people saw how much I, how much stress and pressure that I was putting on myself to make sure that it looked right and that cellists were able to watch the show and acknowledge that someone actually cared and, and respected their craft. Um, and then also as Wednesday, who just excels in everything, the cello was a really big emotional piece for her. And it was kind of um, the vessel or, or her kind of outlet to release pressure from a situation. Anytime Wednesday is, is really, really conflicted with something, there's a cello sequence. So it, knowing how much it meant to the character, I, I really wanted to put my foot down on that, but we just had so little time to get everything and we're running behind so frequently that a lot of times I said, oh, well, we can do this from a distance and we can just do hand shots and this could be somebody else. And uh, that was one that people definitely were were trying to get me to let go of a little bit. But I I felt like I kind of needed that to do. I, I feel like it influenced the scenes to come before and after. And I, I needed to do that myself. 
I'm going to flip that around a little because I know I know the drive is always I want to do everything myself, but sometimes it's better for the production to actually hand those reins over. So can you also give us an example of a time when it was actually beneficial for you to say, OK, you do this so I could focus on something else or the production can focus on something else? Well, when we were in the the last block of the season, we were shooting episode seven and eight. Uh, it, it's the biggest, most action heavy sequence of the of the show and i i remember tim came back uh he went back to the uk for a second to do um some editing on episodes that uh he directed while he wasn't currently directing and we needed to do a bunch of stuff from the dance episode 104 and that was a huge wardrobe change for wednesday she had her hair her makeup was different the dress um a lot of stage blood because the blood rain occurs and there was just no way I was going to be able to go from episode seven and eight back to back to back and then also make that big wardrobe and, and, and physical change. Uh, and I remember there was like a lot of running action sequences in a forest and they were like, Jenna, can can your stunt double do this? She's already ready to go. They kind of felt already dressed her, assuming that I was going to say yes, because that was the only way that it was going to be done. And I was like, uh, yeah, definitely do that because for me to make the big change, it was a lot of things like that that like, practicality wise, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put my foot down, especially if, you know, like the, the schedule's on the line and we need to get people home on time and, and, and things like that. But anytime there was, yeah, we need someone running from a distance. I would please, please take that off my hands. I respect that. I have to let you all go soon. I did want to end with my my cheesiest question last. It's a group question. I think it's something I've gotten into the habit of asking all the time because it's more of a me problem than anything else. But I feel like in this industry, we're, we're very quick to tell each other good job, but sometimes we don't tell ourselves good job nearly enough. So can each of you pinpoint something in your show that makes even you go, you know what? Damn, I'm proud of what I did there. I showed up. <laughs> I got there. Got in the car. That's what I'm proud of. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, it's kind of being self-aware is not, I don't, I'm, I'm not very self-aware, but in answer to your question, I showed up and whatever happened was what happened. That's me. <laughs> what what happened is excellent. I will reinforce the fact that I have been a big fan of that show since day one, fully obsessed with it. And the fact that you all saw us through to an ending with that three season run that was as special and meaningful and is stuck in my mind as much as it has is much appreciated. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'm proud of some stuff with, uh, with Janine in particular that actually hasn't come out yet. Um, always proud of the work I do with the character. But some stuff coming up, especially um, very, very proud of, of it, proud of um, getting to portray it, proud of what I hope it means for people who identify with Janine, um, proud of myself as an actress, like can finish it and be like, all right, I did a good I did good acting. <laughs> so that makes me feel good. So um, anytime I get to feel like that after a performance, like I'm not just cruising through the lines, which I, I never feel like that. But when I really feel like, wow, I kind of let the material just grab me and take me. That feels like something I'm proud of. Quinta, I think we have to say goodbye to you because you have to run off yes. to something else. But I'll just say thank you for being here today and congratulations. I'm sure thank you're hearing you that a lot and they're all very well deserved. Thank yeah, you. I, so I don't know. I don't know how Quinta wears all those hats. And, and yeah. so, that's, crooked. They're all crooked on my top, on the top of my head. Uh, it's you're all mind boggling. Uh, you're all so amazing. Um, thank you for, for having me and congratulations to everybody. I'm sorry I have to leave early, you guys. Thank you. Nice to see you, Quinta. Nice to see you guys. All right. Uh, Rachel, Jean, and Jenna, who wants to jump in next? Um, I, I, I guess I'll jump in. I, I feel like with Wednesday, I, I, I it's really hard for me to be able, that's such an interesting question because it's really hard for me to be able to acknowledge or ever give myself credit. And that's something that I work on. But what I will say about the show is I know that um, before the show being really nervous because I knew it was so overwhelming with the cello and fencing and archery and German and choreography, uh, chore choreographing my own dance and things like that. I, I, I saw how overwhelming it was. Um, I showed up to every day and I tried to ask as little questions as possible and just 
you know, um, I, I'm able to acknowledge now that the show is over is what I'm trying to say, how much work and how much time and energy and um, all that I dedicated to to Wednesday. I, I feel like I really put my life on hold and, and gave myself completely to her. And um, I, I try not to watch too much of the show, but what I can say is I've had people come up to me on the street or, or say something about um, how much the the show meant to them or or I, I even had I had this one girl uh, recently get emotional when describing to me um, how seen she felt and and how that there were certain qualities and traits in Wednesday that she had seen um, in the show that she wasn't able to acknowledge in herself, which was so strange to me because I, I don't watch a lot of TV personally. The show is very funny. I, I don't think it's something to take too seriously, but um, especially with someone like Wednesday who people say doesn't really have much of a personality. The fact that she was able to point out all of these these layers or or aspects to Wednesday that I did kind of almost didn't realize I I was weaving in there. I I don't know for for TV to mean that much to someone and and to be such a uh, a learning experience to, to to be involved in in strangers' lives like that and and I don't know just to have created something that meant something to someone. Um, I think that's where, where I can acknowledge and kind of step back and go, well, at least something was accomplished here. And at least somebody was able to watch this silly fantasy show and, and take something away from it and, um, and give it value. That's, that's, I think where I get excited or, or I'm able to kind of, uh, take a breath. I, I was just going to say, I think, and you all reminded me of this, Janet did, Rachel did, everybody, but is that the responsibility of being uh, sort of the lead of a show and setting the tone and making sure that everybody's happy and having a good time because there is no reason it shouldn't be that way with the number of t incredibly talented people out there in, in all the different fields that it takes to make a TV show. Um, there's no, it, there's no reason that you should be dealing with, with people that are unpleasant or demanding or just drain the show. Um, so I, I enjoy, I enjoy making sure that the set is a fun, happy play. I'm not taking cre full credit for it. We have an amazing group of human beings that do this together and we all just adore each other. And, and, you know, all the crew, they are, they do everything they can to make sure they're available for the next season because they want to come back. And I, and I love that. It makes me feel so good. And, um, like I said, I mean, I just that we're so lucky to be doing what we're doing and, and that there's no reason for it not to be fun and to respect each other. It's, it's sort of like when you, you know, I come from the theater. So to me, there's no real hierarchy. There shouldn't be real hierarchy. You know, in the theater, there isn't, you know, you're all kind of you really have to trust each other. It's like you say, you know, I'll see you out on the ice. That's exactly how it feels. And, and you have to trust the guy who's going to do the light cue the, the split second that it's there and you can't go back and do a, a retake, but it's true in, in television and film as well, is that, you know, you, you depend on each other so much and, and, you know, and we all be surrounded by people that are not just good at what they do, but they're good people, you know, fun people. Too bad you were terrible to work with. I know, and I've waited for this moment to tell you what a pain in the butt you were <laughs> all that time. The, me the meanest. <laughs> Jeannie, I have a question. I'm so sorry. I know we're all supposed to be talking about stuff. Jean, what is that poster on the ground behind you? That? No, no other side. Your other side. Oh, on the ground? Yeah, what it's, is it? It's, um, I haven't hung it. It's been sitting here for weeks. <laughs> I just wanted to know what it was. It's the... Last of the Mohicans. It's an old oh, movie cool. poster. Oh, that's so cool. I bought it on sorry, Impulse sorry. with the I, state sale. I don't know why. I love it. All right. Sorry, guys. I know that we're supposed to be talking about the acting, but I needed to know what that was. All right. I might have been wondering myself, so I appreciate that. Yes. Well, yeah. now, yes. now, we all know now we all know, and you're welcome. It was Thank my you. very first film. It was back in the... <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rachel, you want to bring us home? Sure. Um, I, well, I'm, I feel really, I mean, 
also just have to step outside for a second because this is the coolest thing. I I don't know about you guys, but I, at least I feel like it's so rare to get to do this with other leading ladies. There's no, it feels like there's so few opportunities where we all get to be in space together or work together. And anyways, I'm just, I'm nerding out about how cool this is. So thank you to oh, Zach for that. Thank you, Rachel. But also to get to hear all the things that you guys are proud of has actually has been amazing because it's reminding me of things that I'm proud of as well as someone who's also not great at, at um, acknowledging that. But I think among other things, probably, you know, I've, I've talked so much about how terrified I've been of this show and it really has, you know, obviously there's been amazing <laughs> moments that are not so scary and that are so fun, but there were a lot of really, really terrifying moments for me as an actor. I think our our creators kept raising the bar, which was such a gift and also a hugely intimidating challenge season after season. So because I'm proud of the moments where I felt like I had a choice about whether to be brave or whether to kind of make a make a safer choice and 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 found myself being inspired by the people around me to make a braver choice. And I'm proud of the moments in which um I did that. And and also the way we ended the show. We finished a couple months ago and I'm really really proud of how we wrapped the whole thing up and how we how we did it together and um and how we closed the the chapter on this show and these characters really proud of that and can't wait to share it with everyone i can't wait to see that cry? <laughs> you know we, we cried so much so many years and also a lot of laughs that's what makes it so great lots of I hear you. We, we finished ours you know we're done like there's no and more dead we finished we finished in february of what year is this now i don't even know what month it, uh, i honestly don't know anything in February of a, a year ago, I don't know. <laughs> but like, literally, I know when you're saying goodbye, um, yeah. for many reasons, it's, and and for our show, luckily, we were supposed to be a, a disaster. So they just <laughs> filmed it. They just filmed us just losing our shit and crying all day long. There's definitely a couple moments of of me in there too, for sure. There you go. <laughs> no acting involved. It's the documentary. <laughs> Yes. The, key, yeah. the key is you bring piglets to the end of a series, right? I, I like that. I like I'm a big animal <laughs> lover. Anyone tells me a story like that. I'm not going to forget it. Therapy I thought you were talking about me because I gained 40 pounds. Oh, sorry. No, what? Go ahead. Anyway, what? <laughs> Did you bring a piglet there? Oh, I sorry. <laughs> Well, on that note, I think I got to let you all go. I can I could honestly I could honestly keep you all here for hours and hours and hours. You have made you have all delivered very special performances, but also have been a part of very special productions that have truly brightened my life for some of some of them for many, many years now. So thank you for all your hard work. And on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, thank you all so, so much for sharing some of your experiences, your process and your craft with your fellow performers. Again, congratulations on your nominations. Thank you so much.